this session is about India Urban Data Exchange, building on international standards to connect hundred smart cities. My name is Omar Lomi. I'm uh, a distinguished member of technical staff at Nokia Bell Labs and more board member of the Alliance for the Internet of Things Innovation. Uh, this session will discuss India Urban Data Exchange, IUDX program, uh, in the wider uh, context of the Indian Hardware Smart Cities uh, initiatives. Uh, smart cities developments have initially focused on outcome-driven deployments. Those are typically uh, deployments leveraging IoT devices, networks, and applications to deliver a specific outcome, such as energy efficiency uh, or energy efficient streetlights or optimized waste management. Here, the term outcomes could be economic, but it could also, it could also be about better quality of life for citizens, a reduction of greenhouse gas, gas emissions, and so on. Uh, and then as we deployed new applications in the cities, it became clear that more value uh, could be generated if data sets generated from a particular sensor can be used beyond its originally intended purpose. Uh, doing so requires some ingredients, uh, very often referred to as uh, at the technical level as interoperability. Even it, if it could have some other uh, ramification and implications, such as procurement, uh, for instance, mandating certain access to data according to a specific format, and so on. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce four uh, distinguished speakers uh, to talk about the 100 Smart Cities uh, program, uh, as well as uh, the IDUX initiative. Uh, so, first speaker is Raul. Mr. Raul Kapoor, who is the director of Smart City uh, in the government of India. Uh, Mr. Kapoor is managing the mission that aims to set up 100 smart cities in the countries. He's also the mission data officer, uh, driving the data initiatives of the Smart Cities uh, mission. Mr. Kapoor has had varied experience in the field of government infrastructure and finance, focusing in particular on public-private partnerships. Uh, my second speaker will be Dr. Inter Gowal, who is the uh, CEO of the uh, IDUX Initiatives and Industry Professor at the India Institute of Science. Uh, Dr. Gopal uh, brings a long-standing experience with several uh, technical and managerial positions at Ericsson, IBM, and AT&T in particular. The third speaker will be Dr. Yasunori Moshi. Zuki, who is with NEC Japan, uh, his fellow and board member of the Fire, uh, his uh, an NEC fellow and board member of the Fire, Fire Foundation. He's uh, engaged in digital transformation and IoT ecosystem strategy for smart city. Previously, he was senior vice president responsible for NEC corporate technology strategy, include uh, including R and D roadmap and open innovation. He is also fellow of the World Economic Forums. Center for the Fourth Industry Revolution, where he works on uh, G20 Global Smart City Alliance on Technology Governance that was launched in uh, 2019. Uh, my fourth speaker will be uh, Dr. Martin Blinskov. Uh, he's known for uh, in Europe and uh, worldwide for uh, IoT and smart cities, and he's the chair of the uh, board of uh, the Open and Agile Smart Cities. He is also with the University of Aarhus in Denmark. Without further ado, uh, let me give the floor to Dr. Kapoor to uh, tell us about the ambitious uh, 100 Smart Cities mission in India. Mr. Kapoor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Omar. And a big thanks to OAS for giving us this opportunity to present the India Smart Cities mission before this audience. Starting with the brief, the mission was established in 2015, and the core objective of the mission was to basically promote cities that can uh, provide core infrastructure and improve the quality of life of our citizens. And this has to be done in a very sustainable manner by using smart solutions. And the total investment size that this mission had envisaged in 100 smart cities, which was the which is actually the biggest government-run program in the world and it was expected to be around 26 billion dollars of investments in more than 5000 projects 
the 5000 projects that are being implemented basically try to meet the aspirations of the people and if you try to categorize the aspirations we can probably say that you or me or any citizen would probably look at first the quality of life that a city is able to provide to us second the economic growth opportunities of the economic ability of the city the economic size of a city the way it is able to provide us with employment and growth opportunities and third would be the sustainability and resilience of a city whether a city is green whether it's able to provide us with clean air water to drink and whether it is able to mitigate uh, the disasters whether it's able to resiliently stand when it is faced with various challenges looking at this aspect all these 5000 projects that are currently getting implemented is trying to use a lot of technology and with technology comes its own set of challenges and issues so looking at it actually the mission started the whole dialogue around technology in india with several cities for the first time beginning to implement integrated technology projects like the command and control centers wherein a number of uh, automations and number of devices sensors like iot devices were getting implemented a lot of data was getting generated and at the end of the day what do you do with all this data so when we say that data is the new oil so it assumes that this oil should flow because that's the property of a liquid right but whether this oil is actually flowing whether the data is actually flowing or not and what are the challenges that hinders this flow of data so many a times the other analogy that you can probably use this data is also gold in certain circumstances so how do you convert this gold to oil so that the flow of information flow of data happens required a very strategic approach and why it is data so important so currently if you look at it when you implement any project those 5000 projects that are getting implemented whether they are actually able to meet those outcomes that we had envisaged whether it is actually meeting those aspirations in terms of quality of life in terms of economic ability or in terms of sustainability whether we are able to generate evidence that evidence which helps us move towards evidence based planning and when uh, you have a robust data ecosystem then probably the uh, the right kind of evidence the right kind of data will point us to the directions where we need to move as a city whether it is helping us in building insights when we are trying to implement technology when we are trying to implement new solutions whether we can improve upon those and that's where data can help us in generating the right kind of insights it can help us build use cases to solve problems which are very context specific which are very localized sometimes and especially with regard to indian cities considering that there are 4400 plus uh, statutory towns and uh, urban local bodies in india whether it is able to help us understand how we are performing or, or how our projects are performing so performance measurement is another very important part wherein data ecosystem can play a role and looking at all these challenges what we decided was to actually conceptualize a data smart city strategy and the data smart city strategy is basically trying to focus on three core pillars that will that will basically help in institutionalizing a ecosystem of data in urban india so these three pillars are first the people which is of course the most important component you need people to basically perform you need people who understand data who understand technology so when we associate with professor indra gopal in the uh, india urban data exchange program that is the kind of capacity that we want to build we want to associate with the right kind of people inculcate the right kind of capacities in our cities by appointment of city data officers and helping them understand the whole world of data the second p would be the processes which is the second pillar and by processes processes with regard to standardization of data with regard to data policies where the cities who are going to work in this new data ecosystem are going to evolve uh, adequate policies that address concerns of privacy concerns of security and concerns with regard to whole collection storage and transfer and exchange of data and eventually if you are looking at monetization of data whether do you have the adequate policies or, or not and when you're talking about uh, data standardization is of course a very important component and that's where data standards are required because everyone is trying to invent the wheel and having their own way of storing data the way of collecting data having their own taxonomies leads to a lot of ambiguity and it leads to difficulty in cross comparisons and maybe we are not able to get the best out of it so yes data standards are important that is probably for another session and third p or the third pillar would be the technology platforms that we are trying to build in the smart cities mission 
our objective is that as government we should not be solving all the problems and it is not even possible considering the lack of resources lack of manpower lack of capacity that we have what we should actually be focusing on is actually building the right kind of enabling platforms that allows the con all the concerned stakeholders from the industry, from the academic institutions like the IISC or the Institute of Science Bangalore or uh, the Institute of Technologies to all come together and work on this uh, platform. And basically that will lead to co-creation and innovation in problem solving. So looking at that, the need for data ecosystem that, was try, that we tried to address through the Data Smart City strategy using the three p key pillars or three key P's that we call the people, the process and platforms and having various components, various initiatives on all those fronts. So starting with the open data platform, wherein we start encouraging cities to start sharing the data on a smart cities open data plat uh, portal. This allows the ecosystem to basically get access to data, but the challenge happens in basically making max data available or Many a times there's a challenge with government authorities and even with the industry or the reluctance to share data because a lot of data is sensitive. It may be having a lot of commercial value. And what is required in such a situation is a, 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 a protocol, a platform, which allows you to seamlessly exchange or share data without having to worry about security or loss of uh, privacy or loss of your commercial value. So that's what the IUDX or the India Urban Data Exchange is trying to solve. It is a platform which is trying to basically create the right kind of standards that allows people to seamlessly exchange data. And it is also a platform which allows various entities to come together and exchange data in a seamless manner. And that's what Professor Indra Gopal will be talking about in his session with regard to the technicalities and the implementation strategy on the IUDX. But IUDX is the first step that leads to the third, third evolution of this data ecosystem, which is data monetization. So unless you are able to have a secure platform which allows you to basically exchange data or seamlessly transfer data without having to worry about security and privacy and all those other associated risks that come with uh, sharing of data. So that is how we have to evolve. We have to evolve from an open data platform to an urban data exchange where data exchange happens seamlessly and finally this will lead to the evolution of data monetization. And without much ado, there have been a lot of uh, efforts that have gone in the last couple of years starting with the reference implementation with the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore of the IUDX in three of our pilot cities. And today we have a readily deployable productized version of IUDX that is currently being deployed in many of our Indian cities. And we plan to offer this not only for the urban sector, but it's a, it's a platform, it's a standard which can actually be used across sectors and not only in India, but can be used globally. So we have tried to use all those philosophies that we uh, talk about being open, being interoperable, uh, being compatible. So all those issues are uh, being addressed in the development of IUDX. So I will not exceed time. I would like to close here just by saying that yes, Alliances are important, partnerships are important, and that's why platforms like what the OAS is trying to build and create allows all of us to come together and work together. It's a brilliant initiative. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Omar. Uh, and I would hand it over to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, opening introductions. I see you have uh, an extremely ambitious program, uh, and it's um, uh, I, I thought that your introduction was extremely uh, good to uh, hand over to uh, Moshu uh, Zuki-san uh, to tell us because you spoke about the standards and the role of associations and uh, this is part of uh, the presentation of, um, of NEC in this context, which is about the need for standards and interoperability. Moshu Zuki-san, the floor is yours if you want to share your slides. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'm Yasunori Mochizuki for MC. I'm based in Tokyo, and I'm very, very much grateful for the invitation to join this session. And uh, also, I'm uh, very much uh, pleased that uh, my uh, NEC colleagues uh, working in India are actually uh, working together with this IUDX program. Um, I'll start to share screen now. Uh, Can you see the screen? Yes. Can you see the screen? Ah, okay. 
yes. then uh, I'll go. So uh, I'll start with uh, this uh, NG, uh, uh, simple observation. Uh, standards are essential for interoperability in the smart city space, but there are a means to achieve it and value, which is something that people need is uh, created through the interoperability. And now beyond the protocol level interoperability, uh, we need the data understanding interoperability. In fact, uh, Etsy uh, started working on the standardization of context image uh, information management layer in 2017. The basic picture was to help uh, citizen services become truly useful by enabling information exchange between databases and uh, event triggered data sources in a cross domain manner. Um, by the way, uh, I picked up this slide uh, from the presentation of my NEC colleague based in Germany, Lindsay Frost, who is the chair of the uh, Etsy ISG SIM, as well as the Etsy board member. So as a consequence, uh, this uh, Etsy group uh, developed a standard called NGSILD, which is now the MIM1 and uh, OASC, and here you see its features. The first, of course, is the capability of flexible exchange of information between domains by federating independent information sources. Uh, furthermore, they aimed at the developer-friendly standard by using familiar techniques such as HTTP and uh, JSON-LD, and the team also has taken into account the uh, data on the web best practices of uh, W3C consortium. Uh, let me also point out that NGSILD was uh, developed leveraging the past experience and user expertise. It was in 2009 or 10 that the first context information management standard was developed as NGSI, uh, Next Generation Service Interface, in the Open Mobile Alliance, which was at the time uh, an abstract context API, API with no protocol binding. And then uh, this was used as the central functionality of Fiverr being implemented as context broker and uh, through this community of open source software, uh, Fiverr subsequently developed uh, uh, V2 and uh, V1 and V2, uh, which are uh, HTTP XML binding and JSON binding, respectively, respectively, uh, for the sake of improving the developer-friendly aspect of the API. And uh, of course, finally, most recently, uh, Etsy ISD SIM came up with a specification called NGSILD using JSON LD having a migration path for NGS v2. Okay, let me talk something about the standards landscape uh, from a more general aspect for smart cities. So NIST of the uh, United States summarizes the situation in 2016 when they saw smart cities becoming more and more IoT enabled. And this points out the risk that uh, many of the smart city projects are customized and not fully interoperable or scalable. Uh, in the meantime, a number of organizations are developing standards for the project, uh, whereas not yet seeing the conversion of convergence of standardization efforts. Uh, furthermore, uh, there is a serious gap between uh, standards and cities decision makers. Uh, there are many uh, SDOs and uh, standards exist as a pile of expert-friendly documents. However, many cities uh, cannot afford staffs who are knowledgeable about standards. Another big issue is uh, how to avoid city-city fragmentation in terms of a standard adoption and also the level of implementation, whereas uh, one size doesn't fit all for cities with different sizes and business backgrounds. And this is where the critically important role of a digestion and harmonization mechanism comes in place uh, to help cities. Of course, the city network OASC is uh, growing dramatically by working on a letter of intent based bottom up of approach with developing a specific and simple set of commonly used uh, mechanism for interoperability. Uh, guide, guidelines are defined by national governments are another approach for interoperability, uh, which is uh, more top-down and tends to be less specific. And of course, today I'm uh, so much excited to hear from Professor Inder Gobal on how uh, IUDX will play such a role in India. As I said, I'm based in uh, Tokyo, and uh, Japan is also a country trying to set up a region-wide interoperability for smart city projects uh, by designing a shared smart city uh, reference architecture. Uh, this was formulated and published as a deliverable of a government-funded project uh, called SIP. And this was uh, this reference architecture translates Japan's vision of uh, Society 5.0 into smart cities uh, with placing citizens at the top. And there are several viewpoints a bit complicated that are then classified into two important uh, building blocks. Uh, one is the city management framework for sustainable partnership and business models, which shares reflections of early successful use cases and good institutional practices made in Japan. The other is the uh, city OS as the enabler of interoperability and scalability. 
uh, there have been years of effort also uh, for smart cities in Japan uh, since around 2010, but uh, these used to exist mostly uh, fragmented and such a situation has made it difficult for good practices to be shared, uh, services to scale in a cross domain manner and make the community ready for changing issues over time. But uh, with this uh, smart city reference architecture uh, that is to be shared uh, nationwide now, we expect the data to become connected and start flowing and services to federate, thereby making regional communities a future proof. Uh, here, let me uh, discuss, uh, discuss a little bit more about the importance of city management. In Japan, like everywhere else in the world, uh, there are a rapidly increasing number of smart city projects. And uh, we are becoming increasingly aware that uh, stepping up from the pilot phase, uh, which is where many of Japanese smart cities are, to the real social implement implementation requires a set of self-sustaining mechanisms as a crucial driver. And this includes financial sustainability, scaling of stakeholder ecosystem, and trusted technology governance. You know, as the interoperability is supposed to create real value, we never want a situation where a city builds a fantastic data platform, but nobody is coming to join and put data for exchange or reuse. So this is why such a non-technical aspect is also very important. The lower chart shows the, what I think to be uh, personally the clues to such self-sustaining uh, city management. Uh, along the course of digital transformation, new services uh, should uh, become federated with holistic uh, business model. Uh, for smart cities and how this can be done critically owes to the citizen-centric problem-solving approach uh, leading to visible outcome for the region. In order to do so, each community must focus on its region-specific challenges and opportunities and that is enabled through the collaboration of region, uh, regional stakeholders from government, business, academia and citizens. So it must be nothing but the outcome that encourage uh, citizens and businesses to join and leads to the realization of meaningful interoperability. Also, uh, making a smart city truly citizen-centric means that uh, we are to work with system of systems. Uh, we will use service A now and in the next minute we'll use service B. And we will drive from city A to city B in the next half an hour, uh, but the services should be delivered seamlessly. Uh, and so for such a system system situation, data exchange interoperability needs to be cross domain and cross region and must be shared by a broad range of stakeholders as a built in mechanism because the system must interact with each other in the time scale of minutes or seconds. Also, a uh, trust uh, uh, mechanism, uh, which actually uh, Rahul touched already in his speech, uh, becomes increasingly important for uh, engagement of citizens and businesses. Due to the open nature of system systems, uh, items such as prevention of information leak and human right violation, governance of participating players and data sovereignty have to be all addressed. And therefore, uh, looking at all of these, uh, it is a quite reasonable consequence for OASC to pick up NGSILD as MIM1, and uh, more recently defined MIM4 and 5 as a new working items. Actually, global interoperability or harmonization is also very important uh, for the digital transformation for politics, uh, policies. And uh, this is where the organizations like OECD and World Economic Forum are working. And I'm very happy to see that OASCA are also collaborating with such organizations. Uh, of course, the uh, city uh, OS part uh, of uh, Japan's smart city reference architecture emphasizes the global harmonization for interoperability and refers to the major overseas smart city architecture, including fireware and uh, synchronicity IoT. And as I put red here, uh, you see there is India stack also mentioned in this table, and this is the last topic I'd like to mention in my next and last slide. Uh, India stack is a collective designation of Aadhaar. Uh, which is online citizen identity service and a set of open APIs for various applications such as eKYC and eSign, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is certainly a great achievement that has been made in such a large country uh, with large population, but the world is also aware how the Indian nation has put years of effort into the realization of such an open and interoperable framework. And this is quite inspiring to see the innovative aspects of India stack, having the framework itself designed to be truly user-centric and the working attitude of the government to encourage and stimulate private sector's innovation under the foundational concept of regarding its functionalities as public asset and thus making it open. Uh, 
This great example shows how advanced or experienced India is in making a large scale digital transformation. And I'm very much excited to see how the initiative IUDX, which is now for smart cities, will scale and succeed in building a multi stakeholder data exchange ecosystem through its technical as well as institutional excellence. Now, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very good presentation. Uh, let me uh, hand over to uh, Inder for his presentation about uh, IDUX, and then we'll have uh, 15 minutes of open discussions. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Omar, and uh, thanks to the OSC for uh, setting this up. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, for about 10 minutes on uh, IUDX and give you a little bit of an overview. And of course, Rahul Kapoor has already uh, talked a lot about the motivation and the goals and objectives and painted the bigger picture. So this is a program within um, India's um, digital smart cities um, effort. So, so I think as, um, as um, Raul Kapoor has already said, uh, there's a huge amount of data that's available in Indian cities. Some of this is public, some of it is private. Uh, there's uh, streaming IoT data, there's camera data, uh, there is um, data from legacy uh, uh, repositories and databases such as property data, legal data, utilities, and so forth. Uh, this is all non-personal data, right? So we're not really considering personal data in anything that we do. Now, what we would like to be able to do, right, is obviously use this data, I think again, as Rahul has said, and um, build um, applications and use cases. So there are all kinds of things that we would like to do to solve mobility problems, to solve safety problems, health problems, and so cities want to do this, startups want to do this, industry partners such as NEC and others want to do this. And uh, the problem really is that when you, when you try to do this, you find that, well, firstly, um, these data, data is very often in silos. You cannot share it very easily. Uh, they are incompatible formats, uh, data models. Uh, and uh, also there are security considerations and privacy considerations in the sense that this is not open data, right? While, while, while the owners of this data are willing to share, they're not just willing to open it up and make it available. So, you know, they want to control who they share with. And uh, you need something more than just, you know, op um, uh, building applications directly on top of the data or exposing the, the raw data to these applications. So you need a, a, um, a, a piece of middleware. Right, and uh, that's what really IUDX is. IUDX is a layer of software uh, that runs on top of the data, so it interfaces with the data, and it provides a bunch of different capabilities that make the data usable by applications and, and uh, solves some of the problems of incompatibility, of silos, of uh, uh, security, uh, and uh, control of sharing. So, so IUDX provides three major capabilities, and obviously I'm not gonna talk in any detail here, but just give you a very, very brief view. Uh, it, it provides a catalog of the, of the data, so it lets you find the data. Uh, there's all kinds of things, all kinds of data, and very often if you're sitting in one administrative unit within the city, you have no idea you know, what data another administrative unit might have. Uh, even within your same city. So, so, so the catalog describes the data, it, it uh, provides you the ability to search and find data that you're interested in, uh, either, either um, you know, as, as a human or programmatically. Um, and um, it also allows you to control uh, the sharing of data. So that's the consent service. It provides security mechanisms, privacy mechanisms, it ensures that uh, if there is a policy in terms of what you can use of the data, that policy is enforced. Uh, it provides the ability to um, validate payments, organizational identities, and so forth. And then finally, there is a resource server 
right, that transfers data and uh, makes sure that the data is compatible. Uh, it puts into a common data model and a common data format. And so all of this is exposed, as I said, this is middleware. It's exposed to standard APIs and standard data models. And of course, um, uh, as, as we just heard, the importance of standards. Uh, we are in fact uh, uh, using NGSILD, um, which was mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, we are working very closely with Fireware and with NEC and other partners in developing many of these APIs. Uh, and of course with Etsy in standardizing. And um, as, we, as we have learned from building IUDX, there are many things that we have brought forward to the global community as contributions and as suggestions in terms of how these APIs are more effective in terms of enabling applications and services. So once you have these standard APIs and once you have these standard data models, then of course you can start building the applications we talked about. And, uh, and in fact, we have already done that and we have seen a plethora of applications that have started to develop. So the program itself, just to give you a little bit of a history before I go on, the program itself is about two years old. Uh, it was started by uh, uh, the Smart City Mission, uh, represented by Mr. Rahul Kapoor and of course Kunal Kumar, who is the head of the mission, uh, and the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, so we came together about two years ago. We started doing this initially as a prototype, uh, and then now it is a production system. And we'll talk a little bit more. You'll see some of the, the deployments as we, as we go through this presentation. So it is set up as a, uh, the IUDX program is set up as a, as a little company, if you will. It's almost a little startup uh, within a university, but it is a startup. It's working very quickly, you know, rapidly. We're trying to attract the best and the brightest, take advantage of the fact that we're within, um, we're located within one of um, India's top universities. So we have a lot of very smart people. Uh, we are located in Bangalore, the city of Bangalore, which is the Silicon Valley of India. So we have ability to attract really the brightest and the best um, in, um, in software and uh, technology. So, so we, the, 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 what this gives you is, is a little bit of an overview of the structure of the, of the program. Uh, it is very much a collaborative program. So we're collaborating with um, academia, of course, Indian Institute of Science, but also many other academic institutions. Uh, standards bodies um, um, and, and other, other partners, Fireware, of course, um, Etsy. Uh, we are working with the Linux Foundation, in fact, a bunch of others. And of course, within India, we have standards bodies as well, like BIS and TSDSI. Uh, of course, the government is, is, is a critical partner, not just, of course, uh, Housing and Urban Affairs, which is uh, uh, where the Smart City Mission is located, but also um, uh, the Ministry of Electronics and uh, IT, um, and also the Planning Commission, which is uh, NITI IO in India, uh, we're collaborating with them as we as we build this program out. The idea being that it should eventually have applicability outside of the urban context. And then, of course, industry partners. We have a formal consortium program that we have set up, and NEC is part of that, um, and others, uh, many others. So, so what we are trying to do is three different things, right? Where we are obviously creating open source code. Everything we're doing is open source. Um, it is a distribution available at iudx.org.in and welcome, maybe you go there, download it and look at the documentation and so forth. Um, uh, but we're doing more than that. So, so um, you know, we, we, in, in that way we are somewhat unique. Uh, we're not just an open source body. We create open source as for example, the Fireware program does. But we also have a couple of other initiatives uh, which are very important. One is we deploy, deploy IEDX. We have found that just building the code itself is of a limited value in the Indian context. It is important for us to take it and actually build a service. So we have built a cloud-based offering. And this year we are going to be deploying, and I'll show you in a second some of the accomplishments in 10, 10 production cities. So we are, we are an operational organization doing this as a production service, not just writing the code, but actually doing it as a production service. And then of course, we've found uh, working with um, um, the cities that just doing the technology is not enough, right? You need a lot of other things that we need to look at and understand, such as governance policy, economic framework, 
uh, and um, security and privacy issues, uh, you know, and also some domain specific issues in terms of understanding, you know, how to do, for example, uh, hydrology models in the context of flood prediction. Uh, so these are all things that we have initiatives on the way uh, um, with collaboration with academics and, uh, and standards bodies and so forth. So these are the three uh, outputs of the product of the of the work. Um, uh, just to give you a sense, and again, I don't have the time to go through any of this. Uh, these are some of the six examples of some of the cities we're involved with, and uh, um, uh, just I, I'm, I just want to flash this slide up to show you that that we are we are. Um, um, excuse me, I had a timer. I'm almost I'm done with time, so I'm going to stop in a second. But but uh, well, you, we have a whole bunch of different um, uh, use cases that we're working on. Um, you know, you can see some mobility use cases, you can see uh, flood warning, you can see solid waste management, you can see, uh, um, you know, uh, multimodal transport, video based um, uh, use cases. So we, ha we have really, you know, have a very broad portfolio of use cases and we have a variety of different data sets that have already been on board. So if you go to iudx.org.in, you will find you know, links that will take you to actual live data exchanges uh, in, for example, the cities of Surat and Pune and Varanasi, uh, and soon coming in Agartala and Bhubaneswar, uh, and, and of course, many other cities as well. Uh, a couple of use cases, um, uh, again, um, I'm running out of time, but but you know the main thing here is just to show you that this is real. This is not this is not um, uh, you know an, an academic exercise. This is not a conceptual piece of work. Uh, it is not something that's sitting in the lab. It's actually deployed in real places. So so this is a real example where people are using the product, running running built uh, built applications. This is something that NEC India has built for us, um, working with us. Uh, an application to help the citizens of Surat. Um, uh, another example is in Pune City, uh, where women um, uh, are using uh, this this to actually navigate the city safely, to take a whole bunch of different sources, create a, a dynamic uh, safety safety index, and then show on overlaid on a map of the city the green routes that you can travel, that you can walk, which are safer. Um, than, than potentially the red routes, uh, based upon information such as street light availability and things like that. So these are, these are again, real examples, real deployments. Um, I said broad ecosystem collaboration, I'm not gonna go into any detail. Uh, important to talk a little bit about the Fireware and Etsy and TM Forum relationships, and I've already mentioned that. Uh, and um, to wrap up, I think we are we are really doing something. I think that is hopefully transformational. Uh, we're start of a very exciting journey, and we're really looking uh, for collaborators, partners, helpers, and in fact, we're already engaged with um, you know many of the people who are uh, uh, probably participating in this conference. So um, uh, look forward to hearing from you if you're interested in working with us. Uh, I've got my email up here, so um, I'll stop here and uh, turn it back to Omar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, nice presentation. And indeed, it, it looks real and uh, it looks very appealing and um, it looks driven by uh, real world requirements. Uh, now, since you are the last speaker, let me, uh, uh, and since we have uh, fresh information, let me ask you one question uh, about this. Uh, which is uh, the data which is sitting in the silos. So based on my uh, prior experience, uh, for instance, we have uh, several IoT projects which are about providing turnkey solutions, for instance, for street light management. And the day the city wants to ask the uh, provider of that solution to offer a subset of the data, it becomes a little bit of a problem because there was no contractual agreement in uh, when the deployment has been made to be able to collect the data. This is uh, much beyond uh, the ability to adapt the data and build the adapters put, to put it in your uh, own data format. Did you, did you come across uh, similar situations where the data owner or the uh, solution providers did not want to provide that data? Oh, many, many such situations. Many situations like this, right? This is a very common thing. Um, either, either because maybe there's some legitimate contractual issue, right, where where perhaps the data is 
uh, you know, the ownership of the data is not clear. Uh, they may have, the city may have contracted um, a third party to run a particular uh, function or a service, and then in that contract is not explicitly stated that the data should be shared, right? Okay. Uh, it, it is well, you know, you do, you do for example, the, the, the uh, say, solid waste collection, right? They, may, they contracted out solid waste collection, but then, but then, and, and the, what's specified is the service that they're providing, which is solid waste collection, but what is not specified in the contract is that the, the data that's created should be shared for, for the other applications, which are outside yes. of the picture. So we've run into this many, many times. Um, and, uh, and then there's also kind of a little bit of naivete, right, on the city's part, because you know, they, they've heard a lot about data monetization, right? So they've heard about this. They say, oh yeah, we want to monetize our data. And they, they have this very kind of unrealistic expectation of the value of the data, right? Yes. They don't realize very often that it takes a long time to develop the value, right? The value is not going to happen automatically. What you have to do is make the data available. Then there will be, you know, people who will be using the data, create applications, create services. That will then create, make, make the data value, uh, valuable. So there is this kind of uh, uh, virtuous cycle that you need to create, right? And, and if you take a myopic view that, well, I need to be compensated for the data the moment I put it out there, uh, you will never create that ecosystem. So, so, so I, we've run into this in, in spades okay. all over the place. And this is, a, this is actually probably the most important problem, um, you know, the unwillingness to share data. Thank, thank you for uh, confirming this. Actually, we uh, discussed about this with uh, Martin Brinskov for uh, for a long time, and uh, one of the recommendations is to come up with a set of procurement uh, guidelines, uh, which help even in the case of uh, turnkey solutions, the cities to uh, remain the owner of the data for that particular deployment, and that should be part of the contractual agreement. Martin, do you wanna uh, say a few words about this? Yeah, for sure. And, and thanks for, for having me here also. And thanks for the excellent presentations. It's, it's really uh, interesting to see as you see how this is getting real. No, I think this uh, idea about terms of use is really essential. And from OESC, we have recognized this from the beginning. So, you know, MIM3, as it's technically called, that's called ecosystem transaction management. Now, what does that mean? It means that whenever you want to do a transaction in a zero trust environment or whatever, sure, you can do that. But it, it doesn't mean that you, from the beginning, like you said in there, have to say up front, every time you use this data, you pay. No, maybe there is no pay if you do certain things. But suddenly, if it becomes a big hit and it's quality data and hurt, then you have to pay. I mean, it's normal. So we're going from these, as you say, precisely naive ideas about the cost of the individual transaction to the cost when you are you know, getting value from in a, essentially a public resource. Right. It's like when you dig, when you do the first dig for something in a mine or you know, in innovation, okay, it's cheap, right? Because the risk is super high. Yeah. But if you strike gold, Ah, uh -uh. it's not just yours to run away with, or you cannot just take the water from under Pune and do whatever you want with it. No way. So, I mean, we need, we need this, the terms and conditions in place. And that needs also to be machine readable. Of course, we know it from the advertising system. We know how this works. I mean, come on, it's our eyeballs are being brokered even as we speak here. So, of course, it can be done easily. But now connecting that to the public administration on the ground and the centuries of tradition about you know, making contracts on public property, that's an issue. So I think that's really one of the key issues. And then the next one, and perhaps we can talk about that later, then who represents this view? Because as you also said, I think all of you, where is the voice of the cities and the cities and the communities? I mean, these administrations were not set up to do standards and to, to make demands. They were set up to, you know, govern. So it's a really big question. Yeah. Th thank you, Martin. My uh, next question to Mr. Kapoor, who is managing the 100 Smart Cities uh, mission. And uh, Mr. Kapoor, uh, the world is watching you for the 100 Smart Cities uh, mission. It's uh, an ambitious program. 
uh, when we speak about India, we speak about scale, we, skip, uh, we, uh, we speak about diversity, we speak about a large and a huge number of use cases, and uh, Ender provided uh, a little uh, information about the possible use cases. So uh, my question to you is, where do you stand with the uh, original uh, objectives of the program and uh, what will be your KPIs to uh, declare a certain success? What's your next milestone for the 100 Smart Cities uh, mission? So, of course, thank you, Omar. Uh, of course, we started off with the 5,000 projects that were basically conceptualized after a very bottoms-up approach. We're in these projects were not top down. It was not like the central government ministry decided that the city of Pune or the city of Bangalore will take up these projects. It was something that was arrived at after a lot of citizen engagement, after a lot of consultation. So the whole spirit of cooperative federalism was imbibed while we came up with these projects, with these programs. Today, if you look at the numbers out of the, we can say that 70% of these projects are under implementation at various stages. Some are under completion and some are under implementation. Most, uh, you can say around 20% uh, of the projects are completed. So that's with one part of project implementation. Going forward, what we want to do is basically institutionalize the enablers that will help us basically achieve the outcomes that we are envisaging in terms of economic ability, in terms of sustainability, and in terms of quality of life. How do you do that? You need to work on capacity. So you need to have the right kind of processes that will help build capacity to understand technology. So be it in the part of data or be it in the physical sphere, you need to basically ensure that every person in the urban administration who is in a leadership role, even let us say a cleanliness worker, who's right at the bottom of the rung, uh, that's what people assume. But within his domain, he's also a leader. So how do you inculcate leadership? So those are aspects of capacity that you need to address. You need to move away from a very supply-driven approach of capacity, wherein having these uh, discourses on a webinar, let it be a bottoms-up approach. So somebody who wants to understand municipal finance should be able to do that, either virtually or, or in a physical platform. So how do you create that kind of an ecosystem around capacity? Second thing is the ecosystem around innovation. That would be the second enabler that we'll be working on. And how do you basically foster innovation in cities? What kind of networks, what kind of infrastructure is required to foster innovation? Do you require a city information officer? What kind of an innovation strategy you'll have for a city? So that is something that you need to work on and that's something that we are trying to do. Of course, the whole world around data. The whole data ecosystem that we're trying to build be it the various platforms that we are building. IDS is one such platform. There are platforms on urban capacity, like the urban learning platform that we're trying to build. Platforms on urban governance, like national urban governance program that we are running, wherein instead of every city trying to build its own applications, let's have some common applications. It's the whole approach of India stack. So there is a national urban in, uh, innovation stack that we're trying to build. So these are this is a stack on which all these various platforms will get powered. The IUD uh, program is also going to get powered by the urban innovation stack uh, approach. So looking at this, there are certain things that we want to do, we want to institutionalize. So going forward, it's not only about projects, it's about moving towards an ecosystem wherein the citizen is at the focus, his aspirations are well understood, well measured. So there are frameworks to understand and measure those and right kind of enablers to help you fulfill the gaps once you understand what kind of maturity you're in. And that's where capacity, innovation, and data strategy comes in, all fitting together. Uh, I I agree, and um, I agree. And making the data available is not enough. There are several other ingredients. It's it's not like if you uh, build it, they will come. No, it's uh, there. There are more uh, more ingredients to make this happen. And uh, th thank you very much for uh, all this introduction. I think Ender was right. This is twenty percent of the world population, and that's why I said the world is watching you. So. Uh, we hope that we can keep updated with the, the developments. Now, my, my next question is to uh, Mr. Uh, Moshu uh, Zuki. I ha actually I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, and uh, NEC is of course a commercial company, and uh, there was some uh, there were some thoughts about uh, data monetization and uh, the uh, miss or the, the the difference in expectation between the value of the data and uh, 
the real value of the data and the expectations of the cities. Uh, do you have any thoughts about data monetization? If, uh, for instance, NGSILD will provide some enablers for that, for data transaction and uh, trading data. That's uh, my first question. And I have a second question. It's about um, uh, NGSILD is about APIs. Uh, but we need also in, to instantiate the, those APIs with uh, data models. And eventually different people have worked in the past on the data models, uh, but somehow uh, we didn't converge. We didn't find one way of doing data models and uh, we didn't converge. So if you have any thoughts about how we can achieve convergence of the data models, and if it makes sense to try to see, uh, see convergence, because Eventually, uh, divergence is representative of the actual world and the fact that different cities have different needs. So any thoughts about uh, those two points? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the data monetization also a very hot topic also in Japan, but uh, I think uh, the, the enablers, uh, people are now what, uh, looking at enablers, but the, as I already pointed out, it's really difficult to price data and also prepare data uh, to be offered in a priceable way. So these are through some uh, iterative process of uh, doing that and so forth. And uh, so it's not that uh, traditional, you know, uh, global companies are immediately ready to, you know, jump into this uh, data monetization game, but uh, it will start, I believe, from the uh, players who are very close to the very value creation uh, space, uh, working together with a broader range of uh, uh, people. So uh, and uh, so we are we are we are, we we'll, we'll see okay we'll and see. Uh, about the uh, uh, the next question was about uh, data model and it's also a very hot topic and uh, the way that uh, this uh, you know coming up with a uh, shared data model seems to be, yeah there are five data models now uh, they are working by establishing a broader ecosystem called the smart data initiatives and uh, th the way they're trying to do is to use the existing data models the broadly use data models as much as possible not trying to reinvent the new things so that is uh, one principle and i understand that when fiber and the uh, iudx talked the uh, iudx has also uh, in the, uh, pointed out is uh, very much eager to put uh, emphasis in effort into uh, co-developing the uh, interoperable data models so i think this is a uh, I wouldn't say this is a perfect, but this is, looks like a very uh, exciting indication that uh, people are moving toward a, a really shareable data models. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, to conclude, the uh, last point to, uh, to Martin, what's your view about the convergence of data models? Because uh, OWASC is uh, one of the stakeholders in this. Mm. Uh, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. <clears throat> It, uh, it is whatever works. I, I mean, from the city side, the demand side is ready. And the data models and the harmonization, you know this in a way, ontology of the entire world, is what we're waiting for. And I think we've had, you know, semantic web <clears throat> and, and knowledge management for decades. So there is no fine solution that will encompass everything. I think it will grow in islands that will be aligned. So what we have been doing, like with personal data management, we have joined up with uh, Mind Data and uh, Ihan and Solid as really the proponents. And we are taking the best of, of those leading initiatives and finding a minimal common ground. So I would like to see the same. I mean, sure, schema.org is there and there's a lot of ecosystems which uh, actually curate these uh, catalogs of uh, schemas um, and then I think that the main thing is that sector by sector uh, they start aligning and it will not happen all sectors at once um, and of course the problem is that you know local government city municipality it's all sectors so of course it will not happen immediately so I think it will grow from from use cases but linked to the actors we have around the table here those who can provide both platforms and, you know, end uh, case uh, use uh, proof that it works. And then it will solidify. So I think it's, it's like when you have a glass of water and it freezes into some kind of stable structure, we will have a seed and then a few more seeds and then the bridges will be, be bound. So this is the policy of, of OESC. We just represent, you know, those who want stuff to work. 
um, and we will support you know what comes up and and what uh, makes it possible to come with um, um, demands actually and not try to guess 30 years into the future what uh, to bet on so it's like any norm it should come back to normal contracting where you weigh the risk and the investment and opex and capex and so on very good thank you thank you for those concluding remarks i see david is switching on his uh, camera which means he's putting pressure to get the uh, floor back no, uh, really. I was just uh, looking to join the conversation in a friendly <laughs> way. But, uh, if you see that as pressure, <laughs> no, it's uh, what. Uh, so I, I think this is a nice uh, learning experience. And what I see here is we are moving from the initial deployments of IoT within Z the city to uh, a real data strategy. And the one example of this is the uh, the uh, hundred smart cities mission in India and the IUDX uh, program. And that's uh, very inspiring. I would like to thank the uh, speakers about this, uh, about their involvement today. I think it's uh, very nice presentations. David, if you have anything to add, be my guest, and otherwise we can close this uh, session. Thank you, uh, Omar, for uh, doing doing a great uh, moderation. Also, uh, hello, uh, and, and thank you, uh, speakers. Hi, Rahul. Uh, good to see you. Yasunori. Uh, in there, hello. Um, so uh, I, I thought it was a very uh, a fascinating session. Just just to jump a little bit in, I think it connects quite well uh, to a mobility session we had uh, yesterday. Also uh, looking at okay, how do we uh, you know find this type of convergence or connections between uh, you know different uh, data models uh, and so forth? And it's a question we also get from cities or, or people looking to kind of you know. Uh, bank on uh, the ecosystem and uh, they want this handled. It's not something that will be done, I think, in a, in a, a day or a week, uh, but it's something I think we all need to kind of find, uh, um, find ourselves in. Um, so thanks uh, again. Uh, we have uh, the next session, which is um, uh, coming up. It's quite related uh, to this one, but I, I think uh, it was good to put the spotlight on, uh, on, on India and uh, what's happening there. I think it's a phenomenal kind of uh, evolution that we're uh, uh, seeing there. And as Omar said, the world is uh, watching. But this um, uh, national and regional uh, level, uh, you, you see it kind of rise to, to prominence. You've had cities on an individual basis uh, looking at the um, uh, or working with the international level. Uh, so the next session is all about that. It's about uh, regional and uh, national uh, strategies for uh, digital transformation. So we have speakers uh, from um, uh, uh, Japan, from uh, the Netherlands, and also uh, from Flanders, uh, talking about you know how their national strategies uh, compare. So uh, I'm sure this will also be uh, interesting to the people here in the room. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, let's uh, move on to the next session, and I will see you on the other side. Thanks. <laughs>